Right, so let's start reading in verse 5 of Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read a few verses that can, by themselves are a little confusing, but we'll come back and we'll straighten this all out. But I want to point out a phrase he uses in here. It says, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what should we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then, how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Notice that verse there, verse 8, where he is mentioning how people are slanderously reporting against us. People are affirming that we say something that we do not say. Now, has anybody ever seen that happen before where somebody accuses us or somebody accused your pastor of saying something that he never said? Now, people do that all the time. Okay, If people can't debunk what you teach, you know what they do? They will make up something that you taught and then debunk that so it looks like they debunked you. Okay, that is wrong. That is wicked. That accomplishes nothing. That is not a good thing. And that's something I try to be very careful with whenever I'm debunking another religion or another preacher, that if I'm going to talk about them, if I'm going to name them, I'm going to at least represent them accurately. I mean, I think I should at least do that. I don't want to just get up and just be slanderously reporting against them something that's not true, something that they don't believe. But that is exactly what was happening with Paul back then. And you know why? It's because there was dispute going on back in that day, just like we have disputes going on today. And I talked about it this morning. What we are, I'm going to show you here in Romans chapter 3 is so clearly what we are seeing going on in the IFB world today. You have the old-time religion crowd you know, facing off right now against the trendies, as I like to call them, or as a lot of people are calling them now, recovering fundamentalists that are just, I mean, these guys, I mean, it's pretty pathetic how much they're shaking up the IFB crowd and how much they're freaking these guys out. I'm going to tell you right now, they don't freak me out a bit. I see right through this stuff. But these, the, these old-time religion crowd are just falling all over themselves trying to figure out how to, they can stop these guys from you know taking all their boys and getting them all to follow them. Hey, why don't you just preach the truth? Why don't you just get yourself right? And then maybe people will stick with you. But the truth is, they're both wrong, and they've got a fight going on and then, and you know, and I know everybody thinks that they're the ones that are right, okay? But you know, I think we're right <laughs> in what we believe. And I, and the thing, and the truth is, often what we teach about salvation gets the old time religion crowd to slanderously report things about us, specifically in the area of repentance, which is what I want to talk about tonight. Repentance, that is something that is always being fought in the IB world. There's been several battles over that in fundamentalism over the last several years. And, uh, you know, I've had, you know, I came from the, a camp that was on the wrong side of that in many ways. And I've had people tell me that, you know, I, I, I mentioned this last week when I was talking to a pastor who told me, he said, that battle was fought early in my ministry. And I decided who I was going to get behind. And, I follow them. He's basically just going along with what these guys are saying. And it just stinks because we get accused of things that just aren't true. Churches that soul win like we do, we get accused of things that are not true. We have slanderous reports against us that just aren't true. And it just is a reminder that nothing changes. And so, you know, three doctrines that will, when you teach repentance like we do, or three, do, three I guess you could say three doctrines that will get you accused of the same thing like we see here in uh, verse 8, where it's, they're saying, let us do evil that good may come. It, the same kind of accusations that Paul got, three doctrines that will get you these kind of accusations are um, once saved, always saved. Okay, If you do preach that, you're going to get that. You know, If you preach biblical repentance or if you preach salvation without works, you know, and biblical repentance. If you preach those three things, you're going to get the same accusations that Paul got. You'll get accused. You'll hear people saying about us. You know, they'll hear about the 22 people we got saved yesterday in a soloing event, and they'll say, "You just believe one, two, three. Repeat after me." You know what? That's a slanderous report. 
against us based on no firsthand observation. They weren't there. You know, they're, that's, they don't know that. That's just not the case. They'll say, you know, you think a person can get saved and just go live however they want. You're basically encouraging people to sin is what you're doing. That's what people tell us. You know, you just think that affirming a few biblical facts and repeating back a few biblical facts will get you saved. That's what they say about us, even though there's no change of heart. And they'll just go on and on saying these things about us because they're convicted because they're not soul winning in their church. They're not, I mean, there's churches of hundreds of people and they don't have as many people going out as we do, you know, on, on a weekly basis. And so they have to say these things about us. And so let's look at what Paul said about this subject when he was answering these accusations against him by those who disagreed with his doctrine, who disagreed with truth. And so something we've got to understand is the Bible doesn't always record everything that they were dealing with back then. The Bible doesn't record everything that the, the other side was saying about them, but Paul would mention the things that Paul would mention help give us some insight into what was being said about him. And here's the great thing. Okay, here's the great thing about when we're reading this. If Paul said that they were saying these things, it was under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, it's what they were saying. Okay? Does anybody think the Apostle Paul misrepresented the under, other side? while writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, okay? And I mention that because, you know, if you condemn somebody who's just using other people's words and saying, you know, they teach this, they say that, you can find where Paul did it, but here's the difference between Paul and a lot of preachers when they do that. The apostle Paul told the truth and was accurate where a lot of people today are lying from the pulpit. That's all there is to it. So if you can't get it accurate, then just don't, don't mention it. Just preach the truth, it's funny how some people can't preach the truth without name dropping, you know, because that's what gets the attention instead of just teaching good doctrine, you know, and then when they do the name drop, they can't accurately represent. And we got to watch that, you know, and I try to be careful. Like even when I'm talking about Calvinists, I try the best I can if I'm going to bring them up to accurately represent them. And otherwise I'm just, you know, getting attention, doing clickbait, things like that. We don't want to do that. So let's look at some context for chapter three, before we get into the dispute that was going on during that time. So look at Romans 1.16, all right? In Paul's writings, you know, a lot of times it starts off with some kind of intro, salutation, things like that. But in verse 16 is where we kind of kick off the theme. And notice what he says. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So let me ask you this. Why would the Apostle Paul be ashamed of the gospel? Why would he be ashamed of the gospel? Well, maybe because of, you know, and I know he wasn't, but why would he even need to mention that? Okay. And maybe it's because people are trying to shame them because of the simplicity of the gospel. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 1. 18, it says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribes? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know what we see in the Bible? That Paul is constantly emphasizing the fact that salvation is the same for the Jews and the Greek. But the Jews had certain objections, and the Greeks had certain objections. And we see that's exactly what he starts out with here in Romans chapter 1. It's the, it's the, uh, he mentions how there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Salvation is the same for the Jew and the Greek. Okay, it's, And it's important we understand that uh, in order to kind of get some context. And so understanding the fact that there's nothing to boast about is another reason to be ashamed, you could say, or why people might expect us to be ashamed. There's nothing we can brag about is there. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 7 verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So even as saved Christians, 
we've got nothing we can brag about today, can we? We've got nothing we can hold up and show people and say, look at what I've accomplished. You know, all we have is the cross. That's it. That's all, that's all we have to boast about is Jesus Christ. That's it. So in Romans 1, the apost you know, I wish we you know, could had time to just go through the whole book of Romans, but we don't tonight. But in Romans 1, Paul highlights the sins of the Greeks, and that's where we hear some horrible things talked about. We hear about the homosexuality. We hear about those who've been given over to a reprobate mind. He's talking about something that was very common amongst the Greeks. These were terrible, terrible sins. But then when we get to chapter 2, he highlights the sins of the Jews, doesn't he? He highlights the sins of the Jews. And so now in chapter 3, he's trying to show the religious crowd how in the eyes of God that both are the same. Okay. Now, let me ask you, is there a difference between your typical IFB church group and the people out in the world? I mean, at least there should be, right? Shouldn't there be a difference between us and them out there? There definitely should be. But let me ask you, in the eyes of a holy God, is the difference even worth mentioning? No, it's not worth mentioning. And that's what Paul's trying to teach in Romans chapter 3. He's just trying to show that, hey, yeah, the Greeks are bad, but the Jews are bad too. And, in the, and according to God, both need a savior. And so let's start reading in verse one, because something, and something we'll probably cover in another message is the dispute about different races or classes of people, because that was a big thing back then. There's some people still struggling with that today, which is amazing to me in this New Testament age we're living in, but yet it's there. So let's go and start reading in verse one now and get some context. So in Romans one, he highlighted the sins of the Greeks. Romans 2, he highlights the sins of the Jews. Now in chapter 3, he says, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Okay, if we're all sinners, as Jews or as religious people, just like the Greeks who live in lasciviousness, who give them their flesh whatever at once, what good is there being a Jew? What is the advantage of... For the Jew, if we're all just sinners, the Apostle Paul answers that question, right? Is there an advantage? He says, much every way chiefly, because unto them were committed the oracles of God. They did have an advantage because they had the truth right in front of them. The, there's always an advantage to those who have the truth. So for example, we could take a modern day application and we could say, hey, what advantage then hath the independent fundamental Baptist? Over the lost world, if I'm saying, hey, just because you kids, you grew up in church, you've been raised in church, you've never smoked, you've never drank, you've never been out to do any of the things that all those kids out in the world are doing, understand, kids, you're just as lost as all of them. Would that not be true? That would be absolutely true. But, you know, the truth is, some might say, well, you know what, I, I'm 20 years old now, I'm 21 years old. I never did all the things that all the other kids got to do. And according to the Bible, you know, I'm a sinner just like the rest of them. So what was the point of growing up in an independent fundamental Baptist home? What was the point of all these standards? You know what? I'm going to join the recovering fundamentalists and I'm going to go buy me some skinny jeans and I'm going to get me a, you know, a trendy haircut and start listening to me some Willie Nelson. You know, that's what, I mean, that's what they're thinking. Cause what's the advantage let me tell you, you're always at an advantage when you have the truth in front of you. You're always having an advantage when you have the word of God bring, being preached to you. These people that are out there in the world, they might not ever get it. They might not ever hear it. They might not ever accept it. And if you grew up being taught these things, you had every advantage that matters. Listen, you're, you're better off being raised in a poor IFB home than in the home of rich, lost people. You're way better off. Because these things have eternal value. And let me tell you, the Jews had an advantage. They had the word of God. God sent them the prophets. They had the blessing of God. They had all these things, but it didn't change the fact, though, that they were still sinners and they still needed a savior. But these people are so carnally minded, they're just like, why did I even do any of these things? 
I mean, I'm not, you mean, you mean I got circumcised? I did this. I gave all those sacrifices all those years. And now you're telling me I still am not saved. That wasn't good enough. I've got to just believe on Christ. And here I am, the religious Jew. I've never done nothing wrong. And then you got these dirty, filthy Greeks over there. They're believing just like I am. And they're saved too. And the apostle Paul is basically saying, yeah, that's exactly it. But you still had an advantage. It's just you're carnal because you think that the world has something that you need. But you know, you're wrong. Those things come with a price tag that's just not worth paying. So verse 3 says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So you could say it's not their fault because, well, they didn't believe it. But the truth is, that doesn't make any sense because rejection of truth does not change reality. Because that's how people act sometimes. You know, you, you terrible, terrible people that think only people that believe in Jesus are going to go to heaven. You know, what about all these people who believe in something else? Well, hey, I'm sorry. Your beliefs do not change reality. Here's reality. You're a sinner. You do not deserve to go to heaven. But Jesus died on the cross. He paid for your sins. And he is your only hope. And if you reject that, you're in trouble. It doesn't matter. You don't deserve to go to heaven. And everybody acts like they're just entitled to heaven, but that's not the case. And so, yeah, so, so what if some did not believe? It doesn't make the word of God without effect. Well, the word of God still stands. Jesus Christ is still the only way to heaven. And so it says, God forbid, yea, you know, shall you know, their unbelief make the faith of God or the, the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So, you know, who cares what the Jews are saying or what the religious crowd, what say at the scripture? That needs to be what we got to get used to. Stop getting offended by all the people that don't believe the truth and just say, you know what? Let God be true and every man a liar. Jesus Christ is it. He's the only way to heaven. End, end of story. Well, most of the world doesn't believe that. Well, most of the world's going to go to hell. That's all there is to it. And their only hope is Jesus Christ. And we just need to hope and pray that they'll you know, accept, uh, get the salvation. So verse 5 says, But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Okay, now what does that mean? It, and I'm telling you, man, this is just like the trendies. What he's saying right here. If our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous? who taketh vengeance, I speak as a man. So basically, you could, what, there, what apparently somebody was teaching is that our unrighteousness, it helps reveal the righteousness of God. It's what shows how righteous he is. Therefore, the more sorry I am, the more that just shows how wonderful the grace of God is. You know, so you know what? Let's go ahead and have carnality in the church. This is the Greeks, all right? This is the trendies right here. This is the religious trendies that you could say that are basically like, you know, we're just a gospel-centered church. You know, we're just all about grace, 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 and love, 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 and we hate legalism, and, you know, we're just trying, you know, we're, and, you know, we just, we don't need to be adding all these man-made rules, so we're going to stick with our man-made styles and our man-made, you know, queerdom that they're just bringing into the church. They're going to do all this weird stuff that who knows where it came from, and then they act like, you know, their carnality, it is, it's like, it's, promoting God. Like God is pleased. Like that makes God look good. Okay? It's just, it's, it's like we, you know, every lady wants that, you know, fat friend to make them look skinny. And it's like, you know, we think that God needs us to be really bad to make him look good. Okay. God doesn't need us to be extra bad to make him look good on our best day. We make, we, we don't need to do anything to make God look good. He looks good all by himself because he's holy. So this was a super weird teaching that was going on then. But you know what? I'm telling you, just like the Jews brought over that circumcision doctrine we talked about this morning, the Greeks brought some crazy stuff over too. You know why? Because they liked their sin. They liked their music. They liked their wardrobe. They liked whatever it was that the Greeks were doing back in that day. And so when he says, 
You know, if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what should we say then? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Okay, if our if our carnality is bringing glory to God, then why would we get punished for it? That wouldn't make any sense. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Because God can't be unrighteous, otherwise how can he judge the world? For if the truth of God hath abounded through my lie unto his glory, why am I also yet judged as a sinner? Hey, if, I, if my lie is glorifying God, why am I being judged for it? I mean, isn't that the most important thing, that God's being glorified? I mean, yeah, our church is just super carnal. I mean, you know, you can't tell if we're gay or straight or whatever, but you know what? I just think that just shows just how loving God is and all the LGBTs are going to come in our church and just, you know, feel the love and think this is just wonderful. And they're just all going to just think God's just the greatest thing. And so, you know, and then you got these legalist Baptists out there criticizing us, talking bad about us. You know, and the truth is, you know, we're just making God look good. We're the grace people. Y'all are making God look mean and terrible, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is what's happening. Back in Paul's day, I'm telling you, the trendies, they're the modern day Greeks. And, you know, spiritually speaking, there's no difference. So if this were the case, you know, so verse eight says, and not rather, okay, and not rather as we be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. So he's saying here that there's some out there slanderously reporting, some who are affirming that we say, let us do evil that good may come. There, and let me tell you folks, because of what we preach on repentance, the old time religion crowd is always accusing us of basically being like the trendies. And let me tell you something, we ain't nothing like the trendies. And you know, and, and let me, and it, it's, it's deceptive, it's two-faced, but a lot of these trendies, their gospel does sound a lot closer to our gospel sometimes. It, and, but I'm telling you, some of these guys are slick. Some of these guys, I mean, they, they, they can fool people and they are. But it does. Sometimes their gospel sounds more like our gospel than the old-time religion crowd does. And so the old-time religion crowd, they hear us calling them out for this repent of sins, for salvation teaching, and you know what they do? They slanderously report. They affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. They throw all those accusations out there that we're one, two, three, repeat after me. We're just encouraging people to sin. You know, we don't believe in any kind of change of heart or anything like that. They just start saying all these things. And you know, it's just, it's a lie. It's not true. But you know, no matter what way you spin it, salvation is really simple and works have nothing to do with it. There's this, there, there's no way around it. So this, what they were being accused of was just a lie. It was a weird teaching that basically sinfulness reveals the righteousness of God, therefore it's a good thing, but Paul never encouraged people to sin. He never did. And so they were being, um, the conflict though, it's still going on today. You got the trendies, they're like the Greeks that are super wicked and lascivious, but they act like they're gospel-centered. They act like they're basically glorifying their carnality and they're displaying it in their church services. Show it. They, they, they love how much they're like the world. They love being ecumenical and all these other things. They think it's the greatest thing in the world. But on the other side, you've got a lot of the old IFB crowd that are like the Jews who are impressed with their performance as Baptist. Or I should say, Baptist. Okay? All right? that, and there's a difference between a Baptist with a P and a Baptist with a B. All right? I don't know. They, they all pronounce it that way. I've done, probably done it too. I hang around them too much. But listen, now while we're always exposing the demented grace crowd, the trendies, we do we get accused by the old IB crowd of teaching their de demented grace doctrine. Just like Paul got accused of teaching this weird doctrine that the Greeks were teaching. So in verses one through eight, Paul is addressing the lies of the demented grace crowd. But now when we go into verse nine, he's going to the old time religion crowd. Okay, obviously they didn't have that title back then, but you could say the religious crowd, okay? The Jews, the people who had been doing all these good spiritual things for a long time and are starting to say, hey, what's the point? They, they can't figure it out. 
They're like, they, ha they probably had some young people and some young men in their church. They grew up in the IFB. They grew up with all the standards and all, all the strict rules. But those same kids were constantly wondering if they were really saved because they didn't know if they repented of enough sins because they didn't have the big sins to repent of. They didn't have the testimonies like pastor old time religion when he'd get up and talk about, you know, his drunken experiences and all the horrible sins he used to do in the past and about just amazing transformation that God made in his life when he got born again. And they don't have a story like that. And so then all of a sudden, they're 21 years old. They're confused about their salvation. They still don't know if they're saved. And then all of a sudden, they're just like, what's the point? And they're just giving up and they're walking away from these things because they've been They've been fed a lie when it comes to preaching. So here's, here's what we need to get. Okay, now verse nine, now he's done talking about the trendies and now he's talking about the religious crowd and he says, what then? Are we better than they? No and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that all are under sin. Okay, he's, he's basically saying, we're not better than the Gentiles. Okay, Jews are not better than the Gentiles because Jews are sinners too. So, and let me ask you this. Are we better than the trendies because we don't have skinny, wear skinny jeans and have purple lights? I mean, th think about it. In the eyes of a holy God, are we with our, you know, old time religion look, are we better than the trendies with their queer modern day look? Now listen, I know what you're all thinking. Yeah, we definitely look better. <laughs> Not in the eyes of a holy God. All right, in the eye, when God looks at old time religion, God sees a bunch of sinners. When God looks at a bunch of queer little trendies and skinny jeans, God sees a bunch of sinners. We're, we're not better than them. Okay, I'm not saying, well, let's go ahead and do these things. I mean, let's go ahead, bring, you know, bring on the purple lights. Let's do all this stuff. I'm, I'm not saying that. You know, that's something we talk about later in Romans. But when it comes to salvation, we're not better than them. And we've got to get that down. When it comes to salvation, we, are, or when it comes to our works for salvation, we are not better than the trendies. And I hate saying that, but it's just true. We're not better. The Jews weren't better than the Greeks. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. We all know that verse. The context of that verse is not just that one person in here is not better than the other. It's that Jews aren't better than Gentiles because Jews are sinners too. There's none righteous. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You say, that's not us. No. I, yeah, yeah, there's some people out there like that, but that's not us. Let me tell you something. I've seen some pretty bad stuff from, say, people, from independent fundamental Baptists. I've seen some pretty bad stuff. It, it's amazing what, you know, what we're capable of doing. And so Paul is going back to Psalms. He's quoting Psalms here. This is a quote from Psalms. He's quoting Psalms to remind the religious crowd that they are dirty and sinful. So in verse 19, he says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that the world may become guilty before God. These things that the law are saying, these things were to the Jews, to those who were under the law, and they were done so that they could basically condemn the world. They were, to, they were supposed to live out these things to show the world how sinful that they were. That because, you know, we, in order for a person to get saved, they got to recognize they're sinful, don't they? And that's why it's important for us as Christians that we live according to the word of God the best we can. Our following the word of God, it condemns the world. It reveals to them that, hey, these things are sinful. And hopefully it will help them realize that they, uh, that they need a savior. And so the law condemns us, whether we're Jew or Gentile. So in verse 20, it says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, 
shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So since we're all guilty, then no salvation can be found by any keeping of the law. None. So verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Okay, it's for all who believe. Because there's no difference. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. And he's not just talking about bloodlines, DNA. He's talking about works is what he's talking about. There was a way of life for the Gentiles. There was a way of life for the Jews. And neither were acceptable to a holy God. And they were all sinners. So Paul, is based, Paul said that the Old Testament is now revealing to us that salvation is by the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And then Paul basically goes on for the rest of this book, proving the salvation that we teach today from the law, from the Old Testament. In the next chapter, in Romans 4, he goes back to Abraham. He talks about David. He is showing them how this salvation that he's teaching, that the religious crowd was struggling with, he's showing that the Jewish people we're struggling with, he's showing them, hey, this is the salvation that we see in the Old Testament. This is the same salvation that saved Abraham. That's what, he, that's what he's showing these people. And so then he goes on in verse 23 and says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we all know that verse very well too. And so this includes everyone. And this is what we try to get across to the repent of your sins crowd. This is what I try to get across when pastor old time religion is out there, you know, ripping on soul winning churches and ripping on those who, you know, teach what we do about salvation that are slanderously report things, build straw man arguments, put words in our mouth, just put actions out there that aren't true, that have never gone soul winning us. They've never seen what we do. Yeah. When they went to Bible college, they went with some one, two, three, repeat after me goofball. And now every soul winner in the world who gets more people saved than them is one of these people. That, and it's just, it's ridiculous. It's a lie. And so what we need to ask these people who tell you, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Here's what you need to ask these people. First, how did you get saved? You know, did you, you know, who is it that keeps you saved and whose works prove that you're saved? Because in verse 24 it says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness <clears throat> for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He is the justifier. He is the just. We should never talk about ourselves when it comes to how we got saved. It's okay. It's okay for people to give their testimony and tell about how they heard the gospel, about how they, you know, learned that they were a sinner. It's okay for them to share those things. But when they get into these real dramatic stories about themselves and are talking about their changed life, and then they use their changed life as proof of their salvation, that is wrong. And you want to hear something painful, okay? When you listen to these trendies, like, like these recovering fundamentalist guys, it is a train wreck. I, they've been hearing them do this lately. After they get to the end of the program, they, they'll ask people, what is the gospel? And it is scary when you listen to the answers they get where people just start, it's like they've never been asked that before. And then they just start talking about random things that have absolutely nothing to do with the gospel. And you're just like, are, are you kidding me? Dude, you are a pastor, and you just got asked, what is the gospel? And I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> we've, we've got a real problem here. And you know what a lot of these people do? They, you know, people, and you know, not just on that program, but a lot of people, they just talk about themselves. It's just story time about themselves. How do you get saved? And then it's big, dramatic story time about themselves. And, and then, and again, when people do that, when you go and you're telling your dramatic story about your, I mean, just miraculous conversion about your, you know, 
road to Damascus experience, hey, you are not helping anyone in that audience unless they are from the exact same situation that you are from. And even then, you're not helping them out. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to preach Jesus. Yeah, but to the Greeks, that's foolishness. You know, they think that's just stupid. You know, the old-time religion crowd, they're like the Jews. They're looking for a sign. What do, they, what do they want to see? They want to see a display of the Holy Ghost. They want to hear Sister Gertrude get up and sing and start testifying and screaming and crying and people to start running and then they have a Holy Ghost fit and then now they know that they're saved. That's what they want. That's how it is in this, uh, this old-time religion crowd. Listen, I hope you don't think I'm bashing old-time religion, but let me tell you something. You know, when it comes to the people that are out there today who have put themselves forth as, you know, carrying the mantle of the old-time religion crowd, they are a horrible representation of fundamentalism. They are a horrible representation of the gospel. They're a horrible representation of Baptists, and they're failing miserably. And some of these people, if you ask them what is the gospel, they're going to look at you like a deer in the headlights. They're that, they're that confused on these things. And the truth is, salvation, it is all about what Jesus said. He is the just. He is the justifier of them that believe it. Hey, my testimony is that Jesus came to this earth, lived the perfect sinless life, was born of a virgin, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and he's making intercession for me in heaven. That's my testimony. And I can tell you about when I believed on him. I can tell you about when I called on the Lord for salvation. But you know, the truth is, if your story adds to add a whole lot more details than that, if most of your story is about all the things that you changed, if your story is about how you went and dumped all your alcohol down the drain, about how you you know went and threw out your cigarettes, if you're telling all these stories about all the things that you did and then questioning the salvation of others because they didn't do those same things, let me ask, who's your justifier? Sounds like your works are the justifier. That is not the case with the gospel. When we talk about salvation, we give the testimony of Jesus Christ. So verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Works do not justify or prove that you are saved in the eyes of God. It just, it doesn't do it. Folks, if our changed life is what proves somebody saved, you, know, you realize how much that would just confuse the gospel? Because again, if the Bible teaches one saved, always saved, and it does, and even pastor old-time religion would teach, tell you, one saved, always saved, it's true. But if our justification or proof of salvation is in our repentance of sins and our turning over of a new leaf and our changing our life, then who is saved? Because here's, here's the question, what's the law then? Okay? Because if... You know, here, here's what they'll do. All uh, right, you know, I don't, I don't trust the salvation that won't even get you into church. Well, okay, so according to the law for salvation, I got to get in church. That's work salvation, isn't it? That's, that, you know, that's work salvation. And what about people who just physically can't get to church? Well, you know, if they, they have to have at least a really good excuse. You know, what about people somewhere where there is no church? You know, there, there's so many things you have to factor in. If that's the case, there's no way we can judge anybody's salvation. You think about some of these people that we went and talked to yesterday. People who grew up in homes where they were abused. People who were never taught the truth. People who went to the public school system and taught they were monkeys. People who uh, the government has done everything for them, making them helpless, making them no good for society. People who have not been taught any kind of morality. People who are literally are in prison in more ways than one. They're on probation. A lot of them, they can't have driver's licenses. They've been dealing with drugs. They've got addictions and things they're battling. They've got major things in their life that you and I, we can't even imagine. We were very blessed to have not been born in that. Now, some of you, you might have come from some of that. And thank God if he gave you the victory over those things. But some of of us never dealt with that stuff. Some of us never had to face the temptations that the people and those uh, those places we went to yesterday are facing. We can't even imagine. I mean, some of us in here, we can barely turn down a Dr. Pepper. And yet we expect 
these people, just because they get saved, all of a sudden they can just give up all that stuff. But here's the thing. What's the difference between them and us in the eyes of a holy God? Nothing. And you know what God sees when he sees people like that? He sees people in a prison. There are people, they are in prison. They will, ne many of them will probably never do anything for God. But for some reason, God still loves those people. And you know what he does? He sends people like us to go give them the gospel so they will believe, receive the gift of salvation, and he can take them to heaven anyway. And, you know, and you say, well, then what good is what we're doing? I mean, there's, I mean, is that the life you want? Is that the life you want? Listen, thank God if, if you're in a church today, if you're being told the truth, if, we're, if you're being used of God. And I'm telling you, we've got to keep reaching people like that. People like that are getting saved. Pastor Old Time Religion doesn't think they are because they're not going to church. Pastor Old Time Religion has no idea what these people are dealing with. He can't even get over his food addiction. That is very apparent that he's dealing with. They, they can't do that. And yet they're down on all these people who have nothing, who have absolutely nothing. It is a shame to hear these people say that. And so the thing is, if they've got to repent of their sins, in which sense? Because the pastor old time religion hasn't repented of his sins. He's still a sinner. And you know, they, they can't give you, you know, they can't go to the law because then we got to do all of it. So you know what they do? They just come up basically with their, what they need you to do. And they need you in church. They need you tithing. You know, they need you behaving themselves so he's not real stressed out in his job and having a lot of problems to deal with. But I'm sorry, folks. No matter how good of a Christian you think you are, in the eyes of God, you're no better than anybody we talked to yesterday. We're sinful. We need a Savior. And Jesus Christ, he is the just and the justifier. So, he says, is he the God of the Jews only? Verse 29, is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Both groups get saved the same way. Religious people have to get saved the same way the people in the ghettos do. It's the same salvation. And so I, this, is, this is the verse I love, verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Hey, Pat, this, is, this is one area where Pastor Trendy starts to separate himself from us greatly. Because what these guys have done is they have just thrown out the law. I mean, why even preach anything out of the Old Testament? Why even talk about those laws that are so offensive to people today? Why would we even bring those things up? You know, we're in another dispensation. We're not under the law. But wait, he says, do we then make void the law through faith? Does faith cancel out the law? No, we establish the law. You know why? Because the salvation that we preach establishes the law because our rejection of the repent of your sins for salvation doctrine is us admitting to the fact that we cannot keep that law. Us, when we, when we believe on Christ, we are saying, I'm guilty of that law of God. We're saying, I can't keep the law of God. You name it, you come up with whatever rules you want, I can't do it, I'm always gonna come short of the glory of God. I can't be good enough. And so what we're doing when we call the Lord for salvation it shows that we recognize that the law is good and that we are condemned. That's what it does. See, and that's why we like to preach the law. These, when we preach the law, it ought to convict us. And oh, man, we're bad. You know, there's, when we're, if we're going through the Levitical law and a lot of those, the, the law of Moses, I mean, some of us here, we're going to find some stuff that should have us, we should have been put to death. Now, what are you supposed to do? If I get up and I preach something that says that the Bible puts a death penalty on that and you've done it before, is that your opportunity to get offended and walk out and say, the pastor there wants me dead? No, you know what that is? That's your opportunity to say, I can still go to heaven even though I violated that law? I mean, thank God for grace. And you know what you might do if you get a hold of that if you find out how bad your sins are, you know what you might do? You might be like that woman 
who was washing Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. Were you just uh, kissing his feet. Why? Because she just loved him. She was so thankful for what he did for her. She just wanted to serve him in any way that she possibly could. But folks, how are people going to feel that way unless we're preaching about sin, showing just how bad sin is, unless we're showing people what they deserve? And how are we sending a message of the holiness of God and the wickedness of sin when we're promoting carnality in the church? When we're using carnal music, when we're dressing just like the world, when we're doing everything that the world would love and enjoy, how are we sending a message of holiness in that situation? How is anybody going to get convicted of their sins in a situation like that? Folks, we've got to preach the law. We've got to show just how strict this law is, and it will cause us to realize that I can't do it. I can't repent of my sins. Well, I'm not saying you got to quit sin, and I'm not saying you got to turn from your sins, but you got to at least turn from your sins in the sense that you feel bad about it. Well, I mean, you know, fine, you know, great. We should feel bad about our sins, but I've heard some say, you know, you got to at least want to. Well, listen, I want to break the record for a marathon. I want to slam dunk a basketball. You know, I want to be an acrobat and do a backflip. You know, there, there's a lot of things that I, I want to do, but I know I can't do those things. Okay? I'm not able to, I, I, I don't care how hard I work. I'm almost 40. I'm not very tall. And, uh, you know, and no matter how hard I work, I will probably never make the NBA. It, it just, it's probably not going to happen. I, 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 don't, I don't think I'm capable of doing that. You know, and you've got a lot of people out there today. You have a lot of preachers that are still carnal. They are still sorry in the eyes of a holy God, yet somehow they think that they've achieved this big league status. I gave up this sin. I gave up that. You didn't give up all your sins. Are you crazy to think that you repented of your sins? You obviously haven't read enough of the law. You obviously haven't even read enough of the New Testament. You obviously haven't gotten a taste and a, uh, of the Holy Ghost. A lot of these people going to camp meetings, you know, getting these, their Holy Ghost experiences running around the rooms and then think they got to repent of their sins. I don't think that was the Holy Ghost that you got possessed with because if you got possessed with the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't be thinking, I, I'm ready to repent of my, I'm ready to give them all up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best, give all those things up. I mean it with all my heart. I'm giving them sins up and that's how you get saved. Versus somebody just believes on Christ for salvation. Oh, you're, that wasn't the Holy Spirit you got, buddy. That wasn't the Holy Spirit at all. And so this, the truth is, this when, when you say things like salvation, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's it. You don't have to repent of your sins. That drives old-time religion crowd crazy. How am I going to hold the people in my church if I can't threaten them with hell? You know, if I can't threaten, you know, tell them, you must not have really been saved. How am I going to keep them there? Well, you know what? Why don't you teach them how to love God? Why don't you teach them just how bad their sins really are? And maybe they'll appreciate the God who saved them and they'll want to serve them. And then maybe they will repent of their sins. But you know what you're going to do when you lie to them? You're going to keep them in bondage. You're going to keep them confused. And you're going to keep them running to the recovering fundamentalist is what you're going to do. That's, what, that's exactly what's going to happen. And so people who preach this salvation that we preach, we've always been lied about and we always will be. We get lied about all the time, all the time. People who, they, they get offended by the soul winning that we do. There's people that get offended. There's Baptist churches that get offended because we will go to a town an hour and a half or two hours away from us and we'll go soul winning. They get offended by that. And listen, I would, there are multiple churches where we went yesterday that I would have loved nothing more than to go and represent their church and send people to that church. But you know what? These people don't, they don't want to work with us in these things. You know why? Because it convicts them, you know, when our church is bringing 30 people out two hours away to go soul winning where they can't get three people out. It, you know, we end up condemning them through our works. So you know what they do? They just, they just question, they ridicule it, they mock it, they scoff at it. But the thing is, I think these people are actually going to go to heaven now. And you know what else? We talked to a lot of people yesterday who were pretty rough looking, who didn't look real religious, but were right on the money when it came to their testimony. I talked to one lady 
She didn't look like an independent fundamental Baptist. But when I asked her and I said, hey, do you, do you know for sure if you're going to go to heaven? She said, yes. I said, how do you know? And she said, confess in your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. <laughs> well, you can't argue with that. <laughs> and you know, if I, if, if we talk some, and I did talk to one person that used to go on a church bus. You know, there, I, cause you know, I guarantee you some of those Baptist churches have gone through there and gone soul and you know what they did? They got those people saved and they're still saved. They brought them in their bus routes and those kids, they got saved and they're still saved. Yeah. They're still living a sinful life, but you know what? So are the people who picked them up on the buses. God sees no difference between them. But, you know, and so the, tr the truth is, you know, again, you can have this attitude, well, then why are we even doing anything, you know, if we're just going to go to heaven anyway? Because we want to be fruitful. We want to be fruitful. We want to do something for God. We want rewards in heaven. And so the Apostle Paul, pretty much up through Romans 11, he's just explaining salvation. But then he gets to Romans 12 and he says, I beseech you, therefore, I'm begging you, therefore, brethren, talking to saved people, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what we're doing here at church today? Pastor Trendy gets all offended. I, I, all the people who watch IFB preacher clips, they get all offended when preachers get up and they're ripping on sin and hollering at their people. And they're like, well, you know, where's the gospel? Why aren't they gospel-centered? I sure hope no lost people are there, needed to hear the gospel. Hey, we're saved people today. And you know what I'm doing here today? I'm not here trying to get you saved. I'm begging you as Christians, as brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Holy, acceptable. I'm, I'm begging you to serve him. I'm begging you not to be conformed to this world. You know what? Because there's things that as saved people, we shouldn't be doing. And we should be proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hey, we're getting into some behavior now when we get to Romans chapter 12, but it's not for salvation. That's already been established a long time ago. Now we're talking about what we do after salvation, and that's what we do in church. This is all these things that I preach and tell you don't do these things, go do these things. I don't preach that to the people out there. I'm preaching salvation to them. I'm preaching, I'm preaching, you know, the gospel. I'm telling them about the free gift, trying to get them to accept the free gift. And when they receive that free gift, you know, then after, after that, we hope we can maybe get them in church and help them get victory over the sin in their life and the problems that they're having. But at the end of the day, folks, we're no better. And any pastor who teaches that you have to repent of your sins to be saved is a self-righteous Pharisee. That's all there is to it. They're a self-righteous Pharisee. Pharisee, they need to start reading about reading about the law of God, studying about the holiness of God, and they'll realize I can't do any of that. You know what I am? I'm just a dirty, rotten sinner that's just mooching off Jesus Christ, just taking a handout that He offered me. That, that, that's that's all. That's all we are. We got nothing to brag about, and so this repentance thing. Understand. You, we will be continue to be lied about when it comes to this subject. And a lot of it is because old-time religions fight with the trendies. The Jews are fighting with the Greeks. And they're both wrong. Okay? They're both wrong. The truth is very clear in the scriptures. And salvation is that easy. You do not have to quit sinning, repent of your sins, in order to be saved. You need to repent of your unbelief. So with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your free gift of salvation, Lord. We thank you that, uh, Lord, we don't have to repent of our sins. Dear God, it's, it's so clear we can't do it. We can't go one day without sinning. And Lord, I just thank you for making salvation so easy. I thank you for making it free. Uh, I pray, Lord, you'll help us to never forget that. Help us not to get corrupted on these doctrines, but help us to keep on promoting free salvation to everyone we possibly can so we can see as many people saved as possible. In your name we pray. Amen.